So what makes calligraphy fun for me? These, these static letters, <laughs> 2,000 years old, they, they just, I, I love making them. Um, Arash presented this thing that nobody's ever asked me, what makes calligraphy fun in a presentation? And, and I thought about what feeling comes over my body when I do calligraphy. And when I turn off all the electronics in my studio and I, um, I sit down at that desk and dip my pen, it's like when I first sit in my kayak in the water and just get this feeling comes over me of, uh, of peace and I'm in the right place. And that's mostly why calligraphy is fun for me. It's very comfortable. Um, and uh, it's a comfortable place for me to be. It's meditative. And uh, God knows it's terribly challenging. So, so all of that I find fun. Um, what, uh, let me come over here. What first made it fun for me was, um, Hmm. Rush, did I do this right? Uh oh. Um, I like the order of letters. I like the the known structure. This is before I even became a calligrapher. When I first, what first drew me to calligraphy was um, the clean design of letters that I saw. This was in the 1960s. We didn't have so much abstract now as we do. But I loved um, the hand-painted signs in the grocery stores. The letters just, um, it was a known entity to me, entity to me and, and I find balance and, um, and sound design in letters and beauty in the craft of making them. And um, some of these old examples will probably reflect that sense of order and clean, solid design. This is, uh, keep hitting the wrong buttons. There we go. Um, this is uh, a humanist hand from the 15th century that you might think looks a lot like uh, Times Roman, but this is a hand done document that was done uh, five, six hundred years ago. Um, and here's a detail of that. That uh, structure and clean line still attracts me. I'm still terribly uh, obsessed with trying to create a good, solid, humanist hand. Um, something else that, you, uh, that attracted to me to it is um, the way that it's taught and, and the way that we see letters. We break those little shapes down into many angles, many widths, and... Uh, and relationships between height and, and stroke width and such. And this is a, um, a blackboard from Edward Johnston, who is the modern father of uh, what we might say modern calligraphy. But I guess since the digital age, we're in a new modern calligraphy. But um, he was a great influence for uh, just about any Western calligraphy artist. Um, and in a sense of fun, I could uh, list many, many people who influenced me, and I think I don't have an image here, but one of San Francisco's best that influenced me was Alan Blackman. When I was a kid, I started seeing his envelopes, and I just thought it was the funnest thing in the world. Uh, I unfortunately don't have any of his work, but he's a great San Francisco calligrapher. Um, from a sense of fun, this is Irene Wellington. Um, she was, a, I believe, a student of Edward Johnston, um, she lived in the mid-20th century in England, and there's a, a beautiful book called uh, More Than Fine Writing about her life and her work, and I found a lot of fun in her work. Um, it's movement. Another one of the same era, a little bit later, is Anne Heckle. Um, Anne Heckle, I, I just, uh, these two British ladies, um, I could give you hundreds of examples of influences, but I culled out two that I think are particularly on the fun side. So, um, and then also something that's um, often neglected when we think about what makes, uh, what has brought our calligraphy forward is what was going on in the United States in the uh, 18th, late 18th, 19th, uh, and uh, early 19th century. And this is some great uh, illustrative and fun uh, pointed pen lettering here. The penmans compared with, uh, with constructed letters, the art journal and the illustration. These were influences of mine as well. And as a child, how many times did I write Coca-Cola? Uh, <laughs> Frank Mason Robinson uh, designed that. So when I was 12 years old, I got the speedball lettering 
book and kit. And that's what started it for me, and it's been fun ever since. Um, I'm known a little bit in the calligraphy world for this job I had, which, from a calligraphy standpoint, was not fun. <laughs> um, it's an interesting job to go to the White House and do this. It was a great honor, but I have to say, um, it's a production job. And I did this for a long while, and I tried to put as much fun into it and design as I could, and um, that was a big fun part of it. I would design menus and, and really try to incorporate as much art as I could in those menus to reflect the nature of the event, and that was fun for me. Um, but um, the deadlines and the turnaround, you really have to, uh, you have to compromise your craft when you have deadlines like that. So those are some of the fun pieces for that. Um, so here's a state dinner for Mexico using two languages and images from the Mexican flag. So um, after I got sick of not having fun doing that calligraphy, I left the White House and I dedicate my work primarily to nature. Um, uh, I, I celebrate nature in as many ways as I can with my work, and I immerse myself in it, um, and it has certainly made my work a lot of fun. This is uh, inspired by hiking the entire Pacific Crest Trail, and this piece of art has all the elevation changes of the PCT from Mexico to Canada. Uh, another one inspired by that adventure is a Mary Oliver poem um, called Sleeping in the Forest. And this is just playing and playing with letters. And to get to a piece like this um, will sometimes take me as many as 40 tracings on tracing papers, oftentimes pretty close to completion. So that whole process of conceiving a piece, reading a poem, reading a piece of literature, uh, hiking on it, kayaking on it, uh, stewing, designing in my mind and interpreting those words, and then taking it to paper, that, that whole process um, I just find incredibly uh, enlivening. And this is one that's created from a kayaking trip from Cape Cod to Canada and back, um, with there was little gold leaf at every island that we slept on along the way, my wife and I. So um, here's an example of what I might go through in interpreting a piece. This is a Robert Frost poem called Once Upon the Pacific, and it was inspired by, Robert Frost wrote it, inspired by a terrible storm here in San Francisco while he's watching his dad swim out in the bay. So I took this poem and I interpreted it this way with Neunlin letters, it's about a 30 inch long piece of calligraphy, and I didn't like it, it didn't capture it at all. So it went all the way back to the beginning, same poem, different interpretation, same process, you know, try and try and try. And again, it didn't quite match what I wanted. So three entirely di different directions on the same poem. Um, this for me is, is the fun of calligraphy these days for me. And um, oftentimes having the text uh, dictate the medium. You know, I've never worked in acrylic paint since I was in high school, but this piece, a storm, always awakens whatever passion there is in me. I really wanted to sling some heavy stuff around and get some texture. So um, the piece drove me to work with acrylics. It's kind of fun. Um, and here's another one, uh, inspired by a new series I'm doing that celebrates the work of John Muir, the writing of John Muir, and uh, trying to capture Yosemite Valley between the words. Um, this particular piece, John Muir was lamenting humans building all these uh, institutions and medicines and, and religions for to, to, heal, to, to cure our ills, where really it just requires getting back into nature. Um, and then living on Cape Cod, I had all this sand to work with, and uh, on the internet I was introduced to Andrew van der Merwe. He's a South African calligrapher who is exceptional at this beach carving stuff that um, he's the only one that I've seen do this sort of stuff, so I tried to replicate it, <coughs> excuse me, through, um, through carving letters into the sand and leaving no debris behind. 
It's an interesting texture. <clears throat> and then when I moved out here to San Francisco three years ago, I was introduced to Andreas Amador, a Bay Area artist who's well known for his beach art of massive scale. And I said, well, I've got to do this with, uh, with calligraphy. And um, here's how it goes. <clears throat> So I found that to be so interesting to my whole life done these quarter inch, half inch letters and all of a sudden bring it to a 10 foot scale. And it awoke, it, it, it woke me up to this full body movement dance thing. And that was a pretty tightly constructed italic letter, but if you want to jump into, I do all different letters with these things and some of it's faster and, and freer than others. And it's a, just an incredible calligraphy experience. And uh, here's the very first piece I ever did um, in that genre. I, I was still living on the East Coast, and to do this sort of art, the sun has to be behind the, uh, the art or it won't show up. So on Cape Cod, that requires you wake up at 3 in the morning on the right tide day and do your work in the dark as the tides are going out. So, <clears throat> And here's another piece here on the West Coast of that I'm working on a full quarter mile long poem along the edge of the surf. So this work as I get more and more involved in nature and I do this John Muir thing, I realize you can't do an exhibit on John Muir without wood and stone. So I'm starting to experiment a little bit with, with wood as well. So I'm finding more and more that the work dictates the medium, the work dictates where I bring myself. And this show was no exception, having been a Persian linguist at one point in my life, um, I'm really connected to this show. I don't think our governments do a particularly good job at bringing us together, but culture certainly does. So I um, jumped into the Persian world for this exhibit and created that. Uh, it's a beautiful poem by Saadi um, called I Am Man, and it celebrates the connectedness of humanity. And here's another reason I like doing calligraphy, is I get commissions that have beautiful words, and this is one of them. Thank you.